Hello dear all, today's uh, topic of discussion for this YouTube video is going to be amoebiosis and uh, we are going to see uh, towards amoebiosis from a purely community medicine point of view. Uh, this video is aimed to help uh, students from the Indian subcontinent uh, for the subject of community medicine. You might find it insufficient for other subjects like pathology or microbiology. Uh, but this is purely from uh, an Indian perspective or the Indian subcontinent students perspective of community medicine that this video is made. So what is amoebiosis? Well, amoebiosis is defined by the WHO as uh, any person who is harboring the protozoan called as entamoeba histolytica with or without the clinical manifestations of the disease. Now it is important that this definition be remembered because uh, I mean usually we are not very fancy about definitions but when there's something critical or important to be remembered in that definition, then it is uh, worth remembering it. The word with or without, I think, is the most important word here. And that is because 90% of the world's population who are infected with entamoeba histolytica do not manifest any symptoms of the disease. As the next line suggests, only 10% of the people who are infected with the disease manifest a symptom. And the rest, 90% would completely be asymptomatic. Another important thing that is, uh, you know, worthwhile about this definition to remember is that WHO defines this precisely as e-histolytica infection. Uh, the problem with that is that there are a lot of other entamoebas and they also infect the humans. Many of them are commensals and they are not pathogenic. So the disease caused by this particular entamoeba, entamoeba histolytica, is only called as um, amoebiosis and not by any other uh, you know, parasite or a protozoan. So remember that 90% of people who are infected will still be asymptomatic and the disease manifests in only 10% of the people. That might give you an illusion that the disease is harmless. Um, it can be, it cannot be rather farther from it. The disease is pretty harmful in some patients. It can cause uh, perforations, ulcerations and complications ranging from simple flask-shaped ulcers in the gut to frank um, death and you know it can metastasize to a lot of places in in the body so it's a dangerous condition in some of the patients and uh, most of the time it is uh, it does not trouble you so that is something which is uh, worthwhile to remember as far as the definition of uh, the disease is concerned so regarding the problem statement about 100,000 deaths occur on an average in the world because of this uh, disease Many times the problem is that the diagnosis is quite late because we don't suspect entamoeba histolytica to cause a grave disease. Um, like I just said, it may do that. And uh, if, if, if the differential diagnosis is not kept of entamoeba histolytica, then uh, probably the diagnosis is missed and that might contribute to the increased number of deaths in the world. Prevalence rate varies from, uh, it's, it's a huge margin. I don't think that you need to exactly remember the margin of it, but just remember that at least in the Indian uh, context about 15% of the Indian population on an average is infected with entamoeba histolytica and there are huge ranges ranging from about 3% to 47% um, so a, a pretty large number of Indians would basically be infected with this uh, pathogen however most of them like I said earlier might not be exhibiting any uh, signs of the disease what is another uh, thing to be noted here is that Epidemic outbreaks can occur just like you have in cholera. If you take a large dose um, of the infective organism, you may end up with uh, an epidemic. Or if a large number of non-immune people are uh, suddenly exposed to the pathogen, you may still have emergence of an epidemic of uh, amoebiosis. So this is the natural history um, of the disease and this uh, slide has been taken uh, full attributions to the lady of the hats from Wikipedia who has uploaded this image there. Um, so I, I like this slide because there's not a, lo a lot of complexity on this slide. It's not made from a microbiological perspective, but it is made from I'm more of a community medicine perspective. I just wanted to highlight two things here. Um, the cysts are infective. Okay, so these are the ones which uh, as a public health personnel, we are more concerned about that the cysts are infective not the trophozoites. The trophozoites themselves cause the disease in an individual, but they don't spread the disease. The cysts spread the disease. So you get an infection by the cyst. Another thing that you can note here is that there are only four nuclei here. Usually entamoeba histolytica does not have more than four nuclei. And some of the commensals can have many more than that. And that is one of the differentiating features with the commensals um, and entamoeba histolytica. 
so uh, it has four uh, nuclei as you can see here and then what happens is or rather what I am interested in showing you is that there are two fates of infections here first of all it can puncture your gut and it can infect other organs of the body uh, now the most common sites are the liver as well as the lungs both because of the portal circulation as well as, well as the you know, mesh like vasculature in the lungs so they are as with most of the metastatic diseases they are high priority diseases for all the metastases which happens so again you can have hepatic abscess you can have hepatic amoebiosis and all sorts of you know ruptures and hernias and hiatuses from liver emancipating and you can also have a lung infection um, because of antimoebia histolytica so that is the first fate of the disease the second fate of the disease is when you know, it completes your life cycle in the host's body and then it is um, excreted in the stools as cysts and then finds another host so it can infect uh, other populations by fecal oral route so the mode of transmission of the disease is fecal oral route I mean amoebiosis mean, is a textbook um, example of a disease which is transmitted by fecal oral route so this slide shows again it is taken from uh, Wikipedia and it, this photograph belongs to the CDC you can see that this is an immature cyst, immature because it just has one nucleus, so it will grow three more. There is another feature which has to be demonstrated here that the endosome inside this nucleus is centrally located. Uh, whereas for a lot of other antamoeba, uh, it is peripherally located, but here as you can see it is almost roughly centrally located uh, inside the nucleus and you can see this mass which is stained brown as you know we have done a lot of potato experiments so this is the glycogen mass which is uh, stained brown uh, by iodine stain so this glycogen mass inside the cyst is stained brown by the iodine stain so this is how an immature cyst of uh, antamoeba histolytica looks like now there's a couple of problems with microscopy diagnosis of antamoeba histolytica the first one is that it is not easy to find these cysts so if you have to make a diagnosis at least three stool samples are required uh, to be examined before you declare somebody as free from antamoeba histolytica infection if you're suspecting him at the first place uh, the second problem is many a times we have to do centrifugation and um, then we do a microscopy these cysts are very fragile they may break apart and you might not find these cysts in their original form even if you you know take three stool samples and do everything correctly you might still miss um, this infection and thirdly the last problem is that even if you do everything correctly you are not very sure if this cyst belongs to antamoeba histolytica which is the causative organism of the, of the disease or it belongs to some other uh, antamoeba to which the disease resembles so I mean it's it's very difficult to come at a definitive diagnosis of um, of this disease just by the stool examination so again I said if, if you are coming from a country which is infested with um, antamoeba histolytica the prevalence rates are very high a high index of suspicion um, has to be kept by the treating physician the agent factor as I already said the, the parasite or the uh, protozoan is antamoeba histolytica there are two forms uh, trophozoite form and cystic form as I already discussed trophozoite is one which causes the disease in a host and cystic form is the one which would transmit the disease from the host so trophozoites therefore live in colon and they insist to ri give rise to the cysts some invade the bowel and cause ulcerations as we saw in the earlier diagram and they frequently metastasize to lungs and the liver in fact the liver is the number one site of their metastasis but these two are not uh, the only sites that they can metastasize they can go to anywhere in the body even you can have antamoeba infection of the skin also which is called as antamoeba cutis so there's a lot of places almost everybody uh, almost everything in the body can be infected with uh, this protozoan cyst uh, live for a long time in feces because it's you know very warm very moist and very comfortable for them they can also live for a very long time under your nail beds and that that emphasizes hand washing uh, and the importance of hand washing in uh, daily life as well especially when you uh, have you know taken a dump as well as when you have changed a baby's diapers or before eating food so this is typically when I demonstrate the steps of hand washing to my class but since this is a, a video I can't do that but it's also important that all medical students know how to properly 
hand wash and there are a lot of other uh, reference materials which is available for that so um, important is knowing how to wash your hands well so a, a brief reminder here what i already said trophozoites are unimportant from a public health perspective from the community medicine perspective uh, they of course cause the disease so that's the big problem and but for spread cysts are important because cysts are what spread the disease so the reservoir of infection uh, a thing to be remembered is that only humans are the reservoirs of infection so only man is the reservoir of infection and whenever we say that there's only one host and that is your human being um, what automatically should strike your mind is that okay then this is probably a disease which might be able to be amenable to eradication because we just have one host so uh, that may or not, might, might not be true but that is definitely one of the factors which aids uh, elimination or eradication of the disease so the good thing is that only humans are the host for entamoeba histolytica and the reservoir as i already said is of course the feces which contain the cyst of um, the disease and basically food handlers just like you have like the, the world famous example of typhoid mary um they can transmit the disease from one person to other and in fact to uh, to a lot of people uh, during a very short period of time if they don't have hygienic practices if they have long nails which are unclean and they serve food or make food for many people and for the same reason you know typically when we have this pani puri or golgappe or whatever it's called in your part of the world um hot beds of uh, spreading entamoeba histolytica similarly when we share chutneys you know when you when you dip your hands your fingers dip into the chutney and from your nail beds the cysts are there in the chutney and then somebody else takes uh, from it and they can also get infected so where, basically wherever you sh share food or when you have where you have vectors like uh, cockroaches or rodents or flies they can also transmit the disease and uh, they can also infect the food period of communicability as with most infectious diseases as long as the cysts are excreted from the human body uh, the period of communicability would last okay so only when you have a uh, negative three stool cultures can we definitively say that the period of communicability for a particular person has ended because this infection like uh, we have already alluded to is asymptomatic in most people and therefore they might even not know that they are carriers of the disease for a very long time host factors it can affect at any age there is uh, does not spare any sex uh, it's a household infection much much like scabies so if if a child is brought to you with uh, you know with features of amebiosis it's most likely that uh, the whole family is infected with amebiosis and the features of amebiosis again uh, can vary widely the child may have abdominal pain he may have cramps he may have diarrhea uh, he may have mucus which is passed in the stools you can also have an adult with with the same complaints there is not a lot of blood there is no dysentery but there is a lot of mucus uh, production in amebiosis so that is when you should suspect that the prob that probably the patient might have amebiosis but as and when a patient comes or as and when you suspect that the patient has amebiosis um take it for granted that the whole family has amebiosis it's not just the patient so just like in scabies you don't treat a particular patient we treat a family uh same would hold true for amebiosis also so it, it the whole family is infected uh, that is to say whether to treat them or not that is going to be discussed in the next slides cell mediated immunity plays an important role and this is especially true when the infection penetrates your intestines and um, now is a parenteral infection so it has gone to other um, you know extra intestinal sites that is where a cell mediated immunity would uh, come into play and as i said man is the only host of the disease environmental factors so we have discussed agent then we have discussed host and now we are discussing environment uh food borne pathogen so poor sanitation and low economic status as with most uh you know most infectious diseases we have seen this is a risk factor use of night uh, night soil for fertilization is a positive risk factor because sometimes the cysts are not killed if the temperature does not go above 55 degrees centigrade while composting uh, that is a threshold by around which uh, the cysts would die and you would not have infection but if that temperature is not reached then the cysts might survive and um, if if your food is fertilized with night soil night soil is a fancy way of saying feces uh, you may have uh, the infection by it 
in countries where you have typical dry season and wet season just like um, india the disease is more prevalent in the rainy season and that might be because the cysts live longer in uh, you know in moisture so that favors the transmission the travel of the cyst as well as their longevity so that's why you have um, you know a, a larger spread of the disease in rainy season mode of transmission like i said fecal oral transmission sexual routes almost all sexual routes can transmit the disease but um, males having sex with male or gay uh, people or gay sex would have the highest uh, rates of uh, transmission because of the oro uh, oro fecal route so that's another mode of transmission the vectors are flies rodents and cockroaches typical food borne pathogen can use any vector um, and can spread for those of you who don't know what a vector is a vector is something which carries the disease but does not play any role in you know in in the maturation of it so it is just a vehicle for carrying the pathogen from one place to another so that's the vector so all of these can act as vectors okay um to give you another example drug peddlers are vectors for drug addiction okay so drug peddlers think of them as vectors for drug addiction problem incubation period um 2 to 4 weeks about a month just remember a month one month okay so about a month you have an incubation period of amebiosis prevention and control uh, primary prevention rests with sanitation and which is immensely important so proper disposal of excreta hygienic disposal of excreta hand washing like i said before you have food before after you have changed the diapers of the baby and after you have used the toilet particularly pay attention to public toilets the toilet seats door knobs um all these are high highly infested places with uh, amebiosis and they can act um as a source of infection water supply of course avoid contamination um cross connection is a very big problem sometimes the sewer pipes are cross connected with the uh, drinking water pipes and then you have this uh, contamination with all sorts of bacteria including uh, this parasite amoeba um continuous supply of water is any day better than intermittent supply because it prevents this reverse suction of water which can pull out this amoeba from the surrounding into the drinking water sand filtration is effective uh, in fact most of the amoeba would be filtered out uh, by uh, sand filtration and uh, the, the funny thing about uh, entamoeba is that the cysts of entamoeba histolytica would survive typical levels of chlorination that we use but they are very fragile as far as heat is concerned so just 55 degrees of temperature would destroy them but typically they would survive the regular levels of chlorination that we have so it's it's better if the water is filtered and it's even better if the water is heated or it's boiled okay so that is uh, that is better protection against entamoeba cysts as compared to just uh, chlorination of water so food hygiene uh, vegetables can be washed with vinegar that's 10% acetic acid um another tool that you can use is you can take a ball take water in it and uh you know add soda bicarb to it soak the foods for about half hour to one hour in in that water and then you can rinse it uh you know by scrubbing the food under running water and that should also take care of a lot of cysts in uh, your food food handler screening as with all food related diseases is important if they are found infested then they should be treated and you know as i keep on saying in my class jiska koi nahi hota uska health education hota hai so when we don't know anything uh we write health education so of course health education is very important in uh in preventing the spread of amebiosis secondary prevention you can use early diagnosis um stool microscopy as i said is the tool that is used we would not like to use stool microscopy so much these days because of the problems with that i discussed earlier but we have to because the rest of the the tests are very expensive so still it is the mainstay of the treatment so you can see them in the freshly passed mucus per rectum what you are specifically looking out for are trophozoites like we just um, you know saw that they are the infected uh, infective um, form of the disease trophozoites with ingested rbcs so you will be seeing rbcs inside trophozoites of entamoeba histolytica in freshly passed stools and it is important the word uh, freshly because after some time the cyst the trophozoites would die and you won't see anything in in it so therefore the stool should be examined quickly before it gets too cold 
Uh, there are no pus cells uh, and this is something to be noted because in shigellosis which is another differential diagnosis of this disease you would find pus cells in the stools but in amoebiosis there are no pus cells um, other tests which are available are indirect hemagglutination assay as well as ELISA uh, both these are serological tests which are only positive in extraintestinal amoebiosis so that's one caveat that if you have purely intestinal form of the disease you won't have uh, you know a CMI trigger and therefore these tests which uh, depend on that uh, would not be positive. Complications as I said it can go to a lot of places in the body and can cause punctures and ruptures here and there. So these are the complications that you can have with hemibiosis. It can go up and can cause sub diaphragmatic abscess if there is a liver abscess and it has punctured the diaphragm. Uh, you can have perforation of the diaphragm to pericardium or the pleural cavity depending upon where it has punctured. You can have perforation of the abdominal cavity, splurging your contents onto the peritoneal cavity and then you have amoebic peritonitis. You can have perforation of the skin like I said amoebic cutis. Um, in the lung you can have lung abscess, you can have empyema, you can have bronchopleural fistula, you can have pneumopleural fistula. So, all sorts of you know, like I said punctures and ruptures basically around the liver and the lungs like I said it can go anywhere but these two are the favorite sites the number one site being the lungs sorry absolutely sorry the number one site being the liver so lastly coming to the treatment of amoebiosis well if you are living in an endemic area and are symptomatic you can be treated with metronidazole 30 milligrams per kg body weight for 10 days um, and that should take care of the infection if the liver is infected and you have an abscess there and it's better to refer the patient to a hospital to or to a higher center which will then assess it for uh, you know if it can be remitted by uh, medication and a, and a mix would be given because there are various stages of the disease on which various drugs act or they'll decide that whether uh, you know a surgery has to be done a laparotomy has to be done so you can pay, refer the patient to a hospital if you find a liver abscess but just for intestinal cases in symptomatic people you metronidazole should do the trick in non-endemic areas uh, the guideline is that we only treat uh, asymptomatics in in um, in endemic areas we do not treat asymptomatics because the chance of reinfection and spread of the disease is so high that there is no point in treating asymptomatics. So asymptomatics are only treated in non-endemic areas, all right, because then they might spread the disease and people might get infection where there is very few uh, people already infected. So if you have to treat an asymptomatic case, the drugs are different. You you treat them with diiodohydroxyquine, 650 milligram tablet for 20 days TDS, or you may use diloxonote furate, 500 milligram TDS for 10 days. So either of these two drugs can be used in the mentioned doses for asymptomatic cases in areas which are not endemic to the disease. Uh, for those of you who might not know what endemic and epidemic is, endemic is when we uh, say that the disease is always present there. So if a particular disease is always present in a community, we say that the disease is endemic to the community. Okay. Epidemic, most of you know, is uh, when you have more than two standard deviations of the normal occurrence of the disease so there's a certain splurge or spurt of disease occurring in a particular community that is where we say that it is an epidemic so more on that endemic epidemic on probably another uh, video but very broadly so if the disease is always present there in a community that is called as endemic uh, lastly what i would like to highlight before i conclude this uh, session is that mass treatment uh, mass examination of stools as well as treatment is not applicable because 90% will be asymptomatic so as it is they are not bothered by the um, disease and there's a high chance of reinfection in places which are endemic okay so this patient is with like I said can have abdominal pain diarrhea when you do an examination he is mildly anemic and uh, what we have not discussed is the pathology of it so you can do a sigmoidoscopy or a, a rectum examination and what you can find is a flask shaped ulcer which are completely coated okay so you will see a flask shaped ulcer which are completely coated but then probably my pathology colleagues would teach you much better about that um, in pathology 
so that is what you can find uh, on scopy examinations that's all for uh, this topic of amoebiosis hope it helps you in examination i'm also planning to upload some mcqs uh, for it but i don't know if i would end up doing that so hope that helps you all the best for your exams as well as your career and uh, hope to bump into you someday uh, in real life bye bye